Experiment 20 in Chem 1212 is titled pH titration of cola drinks. And in this experiment, we're going to practice the technique of titration, which we'll use multiple times throughout the semester in 1212 lab. The basic idea behind any titration is to use a complete and quantitative chemical reaction to assess the concentration of an unknown species called the analyte using a known concentration of a species called the titrant that reacts completely with the analyte. For the specific case of acid-base titrations, in addition to figuring out the concentrations of acids or bases in solution, we can also learn some valuable lessons about chemical equilibrium and use the results of titration to calculate, for example, Ka values. In this vi video, we'll talk a little bit about how that works and explore the theory behind titrations. Let's begin by talking about what titration is in general. One of the confusing points about titration, I think, is that you often learn about it initially in the context of acid-base titrations, which can bring in some complicated issues of chemical equilibrium, particularly for titrations of weak acids or bases using strong reagents. So I want to start by talking in general about what titration is and note the fact that we can really apply any type of chemical reaction to titration. It doesn't have to be an acid-base process. The key is that the reaction has to be complete. It has to be a complete and what we call quantitative chemical reaction. Quantitative just allows us to use the tools of stoichiometry without worrying about issues of chemical equilibrium, without worrying about back reactions. The reaction needs to be irreversible and go only in the forward direction. A good example of a complete chemical reaction that can be applied in titration is an acid-base reaction with a strong acid or base. So for example, the weak acid, HA, can react with the strong base, hydroxide, in water to form the conjugate base, A- and H2O. Because hydroxide is a strong base, this reaction is complete. That's why we only use a forward arrow to show that it only goes in the forward direction. The reactants in a titration reaction are given special names. One is called the analyte, and the other is called the titrant. And I'll use red for the analyte throughout this video and blue for the titrant. The analyte is the thing that we don't know much about and the thing that we're trying to find the concentration of. So we know its chemical identity. We have to know that to know how to write this chemical equation. But we don't know its concentration in moles per liter within a solution of interest. The titrant, on the other hand, is something that we've prepared ourselves. And so we know the molarity of the titrant, in this case hydroxide. The idea is to combine the titrant with the analyte until we reach a defined point known as the end point. And at the end point, the analyte has just been consumed by added titrant. It's just been used up by the last bit of titrant that we just added. At its core, the laboratory technique of titration really just amounts to adding the titrant drop by drop in very tiny amounts. So we start with a beaker of the analyte solution with a known volume of that solution. And then in an instrument called a burette, we place the titrant and we add drop by drop the titrant to the analyte until a defined condition known as the endpoint is reached. If we think about how the volume of the titrant solution added is related to the number of moles of hydroxide that we've added, well, of course, that's got to be a linear relationship because the ratio of the moles of hydroxide to the volume of the solution is just the molarity of hydroxide, and we know that. So we know the slope of this line. And as we add the hydroxide solution drop by drop, we're moving an itty bit up this line with each drop, a little bit to the right, which adds moles of hydroxide in a well-defined way to the analyte solution. When we reach the end point, we've added just enough moles of hydroxide to balance the moles of HA. And so we can calculate the moles of HA from the moles of hydroxide that we've added. In, a, in addition to doing this, to calculate the HA concentration in a solution of cola, we're actually going to monitor the pH as we add titrant as well, and plot the pH of the combined analyte and titrant solution as a function of the volume of titrant added. And this is very common for acid-base titrations. When we do this, we get a curve like you see here in black. And a special point is the point shown in red. This is the end point of the titration. The reason we do this, specifically for acid-base titrations, is we can learn some useful lessons about acid-base equilibrium by looking at titration curves. And you'll notice some old friends coming into play as we explore this curve in more detail. I want to consider now in more detail the titration curve for a weak acid analyte 
treated with a strongly basic titrant like sodium or potassium hydroxide. So the curve, blown up a little bigger, looks like this, and where I want to start is on the left-hand side before any titrant at all has been added. Notice that the pH is less than 7. This was what we would expect for an analyte solution of a weak acid, right? Because it's HA in aqueous solution, which is going to dissociate to some degree into A- and hydronium ion, and so the pH will be less than neutral, will be less than 7. A key point on this graph is the point where the pH increases most rapidly, and I've labeled that. It shows up near the center of the curve. At this point, after a certain volume V sub EP has been added, the rate of change of pH with respect to volume is at a maximum. In other words, the curve is at its steepest. We call this the equivalence point. That's why I use the subscript EP on the volume to reach the equivalence point. And the equivalence point is critical. As I mentioned before, it represents essentially the end point of an acid-base titration. One thing you should notice about this weak acid titration is that the pH of the equivalence point is actually not equal to 7, it's greater than 7. And we can understand why that's the case if we think about what the equivalence point represents. At the equivalence point, this is the end point, remember we've added just enough titrant to balance the moles of HA in solution. So all that's remaining then is A-. And the key equilibrium when all you have in solution is A- is the reaction of A- with water to form HA and hydroxide. And it's the production of hydroxide via this equilibrium that pushes that pH above neutral. The definition of the equivalence point is the point at which the moles of titrant added is equal to the moles of analyte in the original sample. This is essentially the most important thing to keep in mind about the nature of the equivalence point. The moles of hydroxide, in this case, that have been added are equal to the moles of HA that were present in the original sample. And remember that because we know the concentration of titrant, we know the moles of titrant we've added. It's the known molarity times the V sub EP, the volume of titrant added to reach the equivalence point. That's equal to a number of moles that we don't know in sub HA, the number of moles of HA in the original sample. But of course we know the left-hand side, so immediately it becomes apparent that this is the way we calculate the number of moles of HA in the original analyte, just multiplying the concentration of hydroxide by the volume required to reach the equivalence point. To find the concentration of HA in the original analyte, all we have to do is take this number of moles and divide by the original sample volume. This is a common point of confusion. The reason we divide by the original sample volume is because that's what we're interested in. That's the solution we're interested in. Once we've started adding the titrant, we've added volume that's really not relevant to the original solution of the analyte. One of the nice things about acid-base titrations is that we can learn a lot about the nature of acid-base equilibrium by studying the shape of the titration curve as well as some special points along the curve. So once again, I'd like to draw up for us the curve for titration of a weak acid with a strong base like hydroxide. We've discussed previously how initially, before any titrant at all is added, most of what's in the solution, in the analyte solution, is HA, undissociated HA, because HA is a weak acid. There will be a small amount of A- in there, and there will be a corresponding small amount of hydronium ion that comes from dissociation of HA, and we can measure that in the form of an initial pH before the titration has started, and I'll label that as pH sub S, S for the start of the titration. This is to avoid confusion with initial, which is going to come up a little bit later in the video. So pH sub S is the pH of the solution at the start of the titration before any titrant is added. Now I want to focus your attention on this relatively flat portion of the titration curve. What does it mean, really, that this portion of the curve is flat. What does it mean that this curve is flat? What's that telling us? Well, we're adding a fixed number of moles of base to the analyte solution, but we're not seeing a large change in pH. And in fact, we've seen solutions that do that before. We've seen that type of behavior already, and that's called a buffer, right? So this region of the titration curve where there's very little change in pH, even though we're adding the same number of moles of base that we're adding near the equivalence point, is known as the buffer region. And the buffer region is very valuable from a chemical e equilibrium perspective, right? Something you should notice is that at some point on this curve between 
the initial point where we're almost completely HA and the equivalence point where we've consumed all of the HA, there must be a point halfway between the start and the equivalence point where the concentration of HA is equal to the concentration of A minus, and that corresponds to some pH value. That's halfway between the starting point and the equivalence point, and so the volume added to that point is V sub EP over 2, the volume to the equivalence point, divided by 2. At this point, and in fact throughout the buffer region, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is obeyed. Essentially, the combination of analyte and titrin at that point is a buffer because we've got a significant amount of HA and a significant amount of A- minus in the combined solution. And at this special point, halfway to the equivalence point, the argument of the logarithm term is equal to 1. Because HA and A- minus are equal to one another, the ratio is equal to 1, and the logarithm term itself is thus equal to 0, so that the pH of the combined analyte and titrate solution at that point, which is represented by this red dotted line on the titration curve, is simply equal to the pKa of the weak acid. This is at the special point where the volume of titrant added is equal to V sub EP over 2. So this is a really convenient and useful way to use titration data to measure the pKa and the Ka of a weak acid. Note that this method relies on graphical interpretation of the titration curve. We have to find the volume required to reach the equivalence point, V sub EP, go halfway back towards the start of the titration, and then if we don't have a point there, we might have to interpolate, and there might be some error involved there. So it's not a foolproof procedure, although theoretically, as we can see, it's pretty solid. There's another way that we can use titration data, in fact, to measure a Ka value. And it involves what you can think of as an algebraic or more of an ice table style of approach. So the key equilibrium, as far as Ka is concerned, is HA reacting with water to form A- and hydronium ion. And if we think about the situation for the titration, we know at the very start of the titration what the concentration of HA is initially before we even turn on or allow any sort of dissociation. We can calculate that from the equivalence point using the method that we just discussed earlier in the video. The initial concentrations of A- and H3O+, plus, well, if we haven't turned on dissociation initially, then the initial concentration of A- is 0, and if we're ignoring the 10 to the negative 7 molar hydronium that's in there in pure water, then the effective concentration of H3O plus is also equal to 0. What happens when we turn on this acid dissociation equilibrium? Well, a change occurs, and so we go to the C line and ask, how much A- and H3O plus do we produce? Well, we actually know that, right? And this is where pH sub S comes into play. The initial pH before we've added any titrin at all, well, that's related to the moles of hydronium in solution at the start of the titration. And if all of that came from this acid dissociation equilibrium, then the concentration of A- must be equal to the concentration of hydronium ion. Because both of those came only from HA, the change in HA concentration has to be negative. 10 to the negative pH sub s. And so we can put all this together in the equilibrium expression and write that the equilibrium concentration of H3O plus times the equilibrium concentration of A minus, which is really just 10 to the negative pH sub s times 10 to the negative pH sub s, or 10 to the negative pH sub s squared, divided by the equilibrium concentration of HA, which is HA initial, calculated again from the equivalence point volume and the molarity of hydroxide, minus 10 to the negative pH sub s. That's going to be equal to the Ka value, and we know everything in that expression on the right-hand side. We measured the initial pH, the starting pH, before the titration began. We can calculate HA sub i from the volume required to reach the equivalence point, and so we can simply plug in and calculate the Ka. So this is a second algebraic or more of an ice table type approach to calculating Ka that also uses the titration data in a somewhat different way than the graphical method using V sub EP over 2.